Let's go, the Five Poly Stock coming at you. Michael Pickering here with our good friend Gregory Day, a writer, director, bookseller, and the voice behind Hipsville AD, the fanatical sect of the god of subculture, fervor, and ramblings of all great cinematic pleasures. How you doing out there today, Gregory Day? Man, I'm doing fantastic. How are you? I'm um, doing good, doing good, enjoying this summertime. Hell yeah. And what top 10 movie list you got going on for us today? We've been talking so much music, but now we back to the movies. What you got for us? Yeah, I'm very excited to be back talking movies with you. Uh, we haven't done this in, it feels like a while, but uh, today we're going to be talking about top 10 underrated films by famous directors. Um, I used uh, a couple different things to aggregate which directors I was going to talk about in here. So I try to make this list as pedestrian as possible. Some of the most famous filmmakers in the world. Uh, we're going to be talking about films that don't get enough love from these individuals. All right, all right. That's interesting. I, I like how you have the duality of some of the most famous film directors, but you're like, but these don't get that much love. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll dive into that. Right, right, right. All right, what you got coming in at number 10 for us? Yeah, number 10, we're starting off with Stanley Kubrick, one of the uh, most world-renowned filmmakers in the history of the art form. Uh, we're talking about his 1957 film, Paths of Glory. It's a uh, World War I black and white drama about a court-martial um, that is uh, about the moral ambiguity of war and... Um, you know, what it means to follow orders and if those orders are just and not. And so it's a great courtroom drama, but it's also got fantastic photography in the trenches. And um, the reason I picked this one is because I feel like Kubrick is someone who is, you know, kind of put on this pedestal of one of the greatest directors ever. But a lot of his films don't get the credit they deserve from his early period, his black and white period, a period before 2001 A Space Odyssey. And he made quite a quite a few good film noir pictures, crime pictures early in his career. But then this one is the one that really um, announced the arrival of a true artist making an anti-war film um, about, uh, you know, what it means to kill another human being um, and what it means to follow orders in, um, you know, during one of, one of the most trying times in American history. Yeah, this one I had not heard of. And of course, I, I do know very well who Stanley Kubrick is. Um, although, quick question up top real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. Was this before he did Spartacus or after? This is before. This is actually the film he made before Spartacus. Okay, because like I know Stanley Kubrick and Kurt Douglas worked together on Spartacus and like word around the water. I can't believe I even said that. It's such a lame <laughs> saying. But you know what I'm saying? Like where it is like... Uh, that, that Kubrick and Douglas really did not get along during Spartacus. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And it kind of changed Stanley Kubrick's trajectory on like getting away from Hollywood studio films. So I was surprised to see Kubrick and Douglas working together on this film. Do you have any like background for that? Yeah, so they made this film first. Uh, but if you think about it in, the, in these terms, this is a film that Kubrick really wanted to make. And uh, I don't know how it happened, but he, you know, Kurt Douglas was cast and they were able to afford to pay him to be the lead in this film. But when it comes to Spartacus, Spartacus was actually originally directed by um, Kubrick. And it, but he was hired because Kurt Douglas was the star. Like, so Kurt Douglas had known him, brought him on. Uh, and so Kurt Douglas was the one who's calling the shots on that film. And that is not how Kubrick operates. It's not what he wanted. You didn't have complete uh, creative control over Spartacus. So he left and it was finished by another director, Anthony Mann, I believe, um, who, was a, who was a great director in his own right. But um, it's that different power dynamic where Kubrick was in charge of this film and Kurt Douglas was really um, in charge of the other film. All right. All right. Excellent. Um, because I was so curious about that. I was like, how are those two working together? Uh, so I figured this one may have come before. But like yeah. I said, I had never heard of this movie. And I was watching the trailer that she sent. And there was this one part of it that really caught me. And it was Douglas's character talking to a commander about the battlefield plan. And the commander was saying, like, what percentage of the troops were going to be lost at each stage of the progression of the battle. And by the end of the plan, Douglas was like, yo, you're telling me over half of my troops are going to die. And the commander seemed completely okay with that. But Douglas mm -hmm. was so conflicted with the idea of like, I can't believe we're actually choosing this plan. And I can't believe that this person or the whole, you know, the whole commander group rather said that the overall objective is more important than the independent soldiers. And Douglas was the commander of the troops. And it was like, I can't see that. Um, mm -hmm. Is that really like the focus of the film? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's got kind of two parts. One where it's really digging into what trench life was like in the war in World War One. Uh, but yeah, it's really about like these higher ups giving these commands that, um, you know, for one reason or another, they've chosen them, even though they may not be the right thing to do or the most uh, humanistic thing to do. And so uh, Kurt Dux is torn between, you know, his position as being um, the commanding officer with his troops, who lives with his troops, who knows who they are, um, versus having to take the the uh, commands from his higher ups. And it's sort of that that moral ambiguity that he has to deal with that leads to the court martial when people don't want to do this this plan um and how you know how people of power use certain and you know people without power as scapegoats um and it gets you know it gets into that kind of stuff uh during the trial and so yeah it's a definitely an anti-war film and but it's looking at it you know for the 50s this is a big deal looking at it um from the point of view of the politics of war yeah, in the 50s, I mean, we think that, you know, World War II was over, but there was war going on all over the place in the 50s. There was wars in, in Latin America and places like Guatemala and other countries. You know, the, the Vietnam War or France's version of the Vietnam War was going on. Uh, mm -hmm. Korean War was going on. I mean, yeah. so an anti-war film to come out in the 1950s during all of that, that's a pretty big deal. And like I said, I'd never heard of this one. I Technical difficulty, we got cut off and the edit's going to be horrible, but you can deal with it. It's summertime. It doesn't have to be perfect, people. My whole point was that there were so many wars going on in the 1950s. And to have this come out as an anti-war film with, you know, one of your biggest stars at the time, Kurt Douglas, and Stanley Kubrick, one of the legendary directors of the day. It's a pretty powerful message for the 1950s, for sure, man. I think this is a great one. Like I said, I've never heard of it. Yeah. All right, what do you have coming in at number nine? Yeah, number nine. Uh, we're talking about Steven Spielberg. He is one of, you know, if not the most famous filmmaker in his, the history of the world. Um, I want to talk about a little picture that he did in 2002 called Catch Me If You Can. Uh, many people probably know of this one, but it kind of came and went and it's kind of really been lost uh, to the, to the, uh, in the film circles now. Uh, but yeah, this is a great, fun uh, flick with Leonardo DiCaprio, who is, who is a young, um, a forger and a con artist he's just a teenager and uh he's just it's almost like this 60s jet setting kind of adventure where he's just playing it being all these different professions and he's a pilot he's a doctor he's a school teacher he's just kind of uh going on and on and kind of uh, you know living up this life and tom hanks is the you know the federal agent who's chasing him trying to catch on to who this uh, master forger is until he realizes that, that this is teenager um it's like an homage to Alfred Hitchcock films like North by Northwest. And he's kind of like uh, global, you know, globe trotting kind of adventures. But, you know, this is one I think that Spielberg as a director just has a lot of fun making and it doesn't get too sappy or it doesn't get too into the action set pieces or anything, but it's just a whimsical fun time with the movies. You know, I will, I will go ahead and say uh, right up top, this is likely one of the only Leo movies I actually like. Um, and, and, you know, I was surprised when I saw it came out in 2002, because mm -hmm. I really thought that this was an older movie than that. Um, I thought it was like a 90s Spielberg flick. And it, it's based on a true story about a con man writing fake checks and running around from the FBI. But I was wondering, like, do you have any background into like how accurate it is? Or did, did Spielberg take like a lot of creative license with it? Honestly, I don't know. I've only seen this film once and it made such an impression on me. I actually loved it because to be completely honest with the listeners and with you, I am not a Spielberg fan. I like very few <laughs> of his movies. Uh, if you know the movies I choose on this, of this podcast, then you kind of can get a sense of that. But um, it's a film that I think whether it sticks to its story or not, you know, the true events or not, I think it just it really sells, you know, the, the adventure, the feeling of this adventure, even though it's all based on crime. Um, and that's why, that's why I really love it. I think you're, you're right that, um, you know, this film is definitely to me a different feel of a Spielberg film. Uh, I liked it. I don't think I've seen it more than once either. And, and maybe like both of us, you know, who watched movies back then, especially, Maybe we're part of the reason why it's underrated because we, even we only watched it once, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm with you on the Spielberg thing. You know, I think Jaws is completely overrated. I don't care if it was the first blockbuster <laughs> or whatever. You know, it was a movie about a shark. Get over it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's uh, actually the only Spielberg <laughs> film that I really love. <laughs> oh, is it? Because it's, oh. it's just a fun monster movie. You know, it's not, not worrying about the, you know, this, his sappy dad issues or, 
you know, things like that that are in a lot of his other films. Just give me a shark munching up people and in the in the thrill ride, you know, that's what it is. Oh, go figure. We're at odds. So let's keep going, though. Number eight, what you yeah. got for us? Number eight. Yeah, this, this one also may not be uh, in certain circles uh, deemed underrated, but uh, we're talking about Quentin Tarantino's Jackie Brown from 1997. This was the film that he made after Pulp Fiction, and it was not quite what I think audiences were looking for. This is a follow-up to Pulp Fiction. It's a much more subdued film. It's a much more introspective film. It's a film that takes its characters way uh, more serious than Pulp Fiction did. Um, it's a, it's you know, really a film about aging. Uh, it's got some great performances from genre film uh, legends like Pan Greer and Robert Forrester. And of course you got Samuel L. Jackson, Robert De Niro and Chris Tucker uh, have some great roles in this film as well. But this is a film that's just um, in hindsight, like you're looking at from Kill Bill to uh, Inglorious Bastards um, to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This is a film that's kind of gets lost in the shuffle when people talk about um, Quentin Tarantino films. And this is my personal favorite of his. And I don't think he's been able to top it because it's a film that I feel like comes from the heart where uh, whereas a lot of his other films come from his love of cinema and his love of writing, you know, these big bombastic um, political genre films. But this one, um, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend checking it out. It's just a great... A uh, crime film, but it's uh, disguised as a hangout film. So you're just basically spending two and a half hours with these characters, which feels like a long weekend, as opposed to a very high stakes um, crime or gangster film. I think a hangout film is a perfect way to to describe this to listeners who haven't seen it, because this one it's been a long time since I've seen it, but I definitely think this is one of my favorite. Uh, Tarantino films and not that I'm a huge Tarantino fan there's some of them that I like but I think I completely agree with you that this is probably his most underrated film and least talked about film I mean maybe maybe it's because it always seems like he's always one-upping himself always outdoing himself with his new projects and if you mm -hmm. ask Tarantino fans to recall their faves you know they automatically Reservoir Dogs or Pulp Fiction you know and that's all they think about and that's all they talk about but I think this one, like you said, this is a cool film to just chill with. Uh, I do think though, looking back at the trailers and, and remembering some things, this is most certainly a 90s movie. And I it, like, although Tarantino is always controversial with his dialogue, I think this one, this one definitely fits into that controversial area with Tarantino for <laughs> sure. Oh, 100%. But nice choice. I think you're right. Underrated for his mm -hmm. films. Yeah. All right. What's what, what do we got for number seven? Yeah, number seven is a little... Alfred Hitchcock movie from 1953 called I Confess. Uh, this is one I think that gets really lost in the shuffle of talking about Hitchcock. I mean, he's like Spielberg, you know, probably the first two names if you Google famous filmmakers that comes up. Um, and so this is a this is a typical Hitchcock film. It's a murder mystery, but uh, I think the, the interesting thing about it is it's, is this uh, guy commits this murder and then he confesses to a priest and then he sets up the priest uh, as the as the you know, or he frames the priest, I should say, uh, for the murder. And so this priest cannot or will not break his vows to um, the secrecy of confession. And so he, you know, this is a great performance by uh, Montgomery Clift in the lead, who's playing the priest, who is struggling to keep his, his convictions as he's being pressured by the police, whether he's going to be uh, arrested and um, convicted of this murder or if he's going to betray his beliefs and give up the person who has set him up so uh this one it's it's not as sensationalist as a lot of other hitchcock films it's not as you know it's not like a high adventure film it's set in the like and it's shot in these really moody um black and white at atmosphere in quebec which is really cool to see quebec um the way that this film portrays it and um you know hitchcock really like each of his films has a different location. You notice if you watch his films, each film is in a different city around the world. Um, and so the locations are very important to him. And so this one is like sort of Gothic architecture in Quebec uh, looks really cool on screen. And so, um, yeah, I just want to bring this one up because it's, it's such a smaller movie than he would usually do. Uh, but it's, I think one of his uh, least appreciated films. Real quick, I'll give a shout out to Quebec City, Quebec, and agree with you. If you want to see like a true European kind of feeling, old school town city, Quebec City, Quebec, the old city, and it's mm. beautiful. It's beautiful. And some of the shots that were in the trailers of this film, I mean, it was just spot on. It's an amazing location for sure. And I think you are right. Alfred Hitchcock is arguably 
one of the most famous directors ever out of Hollywood. But you know what? I've never seen a single one of his movies. Not a single one. So uh, this one's all you. And I think maybe I am part of the problem with why, you know, so much of his stuff is underrated because I've never seen any of it. But it, it makes mm -hmm. me wonder, and this is kind of a question to you, um, Hitchcock, you know, is a legend for sure. But I wonder if our generation's maybe the last generation who knows that. I wonder if like the generations after ours even know who Hitchcock is or have ever seen any one of his films. And I think more and more, instead of being a part of pop culture and influence with his films, he has just kind of shifted into this legendary figure. And I wonder if maybe, you know, that's not what's going to happen to you know, Quentin Tarantino one day, Steven Spielberg, you know, all the great directors. I mean, how do you feel about Hitchcock being alive in cinema pop culture today? Yeah, I mean, I feel like people still bring him up, uh, like in film circles. Um, I mean, like any any filmmaker, I mean, there's watching his films, I think from a younger audience's point of view, watching his films, you have to take them as when they were made. Uh, so a lot of the political landscape is different. A lot of the gender dynamics are different um, than, than now. And so, but I think if you're looking at, Hitch, what, what you should really be looking at Hitchcock for is the craft of the filmmaking and his, his storytelling techniques. Uh, he is one of the most important filmmakers in the history of cinema, uh, undeniably for those two things. Um, I think you could disregard a lot of the things he was doing with uh, gender and things, um, but it's his way of telling, the way of illustrating suspense in his films that is unparalleled and he changed the course of, of cinema everyone who came after him from Spielberg to Scorsese um, and on down the line even even Quentin Tarantino all steal from Hitchcock there's undeniable that everyone takes from him um, and so I hope that he doesn't get lost in the shuffle even though there are many reasons to not really want to watch Hitchcock or um, you know especially for his personal behavior later in his career but um yeah, I mean, he's one of the most important filmmakers, period. And I think, or at least I hope that, you know, future generations continue to appreciate the things that he did and look to them for inspiration to carry on those those things that make suspense films and romance films and horror films, you know, as good as they are now. Right, right. And I, I'm curious, I'm going to save this one for mm -hmm. a later a later pick that you have, but I'm curious if, if Hitchcock in the time that he was in had an influence perhaps on another director who was making films around the same era, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Which you got coming in at number six then? Yeah, number six. Uh, this is probably my, one of my favorite films by this director, uh, but it's Clockers from 1995 by Spike Lee. Um, this one, for some reason, gets kind of uh, brushed aside. It's, to me, Spike Lee's most visually um, exciting film. It's it's very visually experimental, um, and it's sort of a precursor to The Wire. You get this uh, great story of this uh, guy who lives in this neighborhood, and he witnesses a murder um, or shooting in his neighborhood, and he's pressured by the police to be to to come forward as a witness. But he's also got to live his life in his neighborhood, where he knows the drug dealers and the gangsters who live around there, and you know they're watching him. They're making sure that he's not gonna. Um, snitch on them and so this is uh it's really a thriller of this guy caught between these two these two um you know almost these two opposing forces but they all want something from him and he doesn't quite know what he wants he doesn't quite know what he where he's going in his life and so um yeah it's a great depiction of these uh neighborhoods during this time where there's high crime and there's the police uh the, and the policing of these neighborhoods which is always not um you know, it's not always above boards, but uh, it's got great performances in the film and it's, it's kind of a wild ride. So it's got this uh, sort of like frenetic rushing style to it that, it that I think is in some Spike Lee films, but it doesn't dive, uh, doesn't have take the opportunity to dive deep into um, some of the slower parts of, uh, of existence. And so I think maybe it's because it's so aggressive in its storytelling style that people tend to, to look at some of his other films more than this one. You know, this is this is one of Spike Lee's that I haven't seen, and I really don't even know if I've heard of it before. When I was watching the trailer, like it seemed familiar, but maybe it was just familiar because of the phenomenal list of people playing parts in the movies. Mm -hmm. Like there was a ton of amazing people in here. Um, so this one I really, really want to check out. And 
you know, it leads me to a question about this film. And really, I was thinking about asking you for every film, but it'd get a little too repetitive. But I want to mm -hmm. ask you for this one in particular. Why do you think Clockers is underrated and, and maybe overshadowed by other Spike Lee films? And if it is the idea of overshadowed, which other ones do you think really make this film underrated? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, many of his films starred Denzel Washington. And so I think that star combination of him with Spike uh, definitely pushes films into the forefront of mainstream cinema. So um, films like uh, Malcolm X definitely is it, by no means a bad movie. It's a it's a masterpiece. It's a great film, um, but also Do the Right Thing, which is probably Spike Lee's masterpiece. Uh, so those two films are definitely films that are widely discussed in uh, popular culture. But I think with this film, it gets it's underrated because it doesn't get the attention that it deserves as this, uh, you know, this great film that is exploring these uh, underserved neighborhoods. And it's kind of got this energy to it that is maybe a little off putting to, to the main, uh, mainstream audience. You know, it's, it makes it a little more dangerous um, and a little, maybe a little harder to um, to absorb than some of his other films. Well, I could definitely see that um, the digestibility of a film and, you know, for audiences to to be able to sit and actually take in what Spike Lee's message is, you know, he is a controversial director in many people's eyes with the subject matter and how he takes on the subject matter. And I think you're right. Him and Denzel, especially Malcolm X, is probably one of the films that first comes to mind whenever you say Spike Lee. Um, so yeah, he definitely has a lot of work out there, but like I said, this trailer really intrigued me and I'm gonna have to check this one out for sure. Yeah. All right. What you got coming in at number five for us? Yeah. Number five, uh, this is a film called bullet in the head from 1990 by the famous action director, John Woo. I'm going to um, have to start checking every list to see, do you have John <laughs> Woo on every list? I love it, man. I love it. Keep going. Yeah. 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 John Woo. So this one, um, he had, him. he has many notable films like his Hong Kong part of his career, you know, hard boiled and the killer. He's a very famous action film starring Chai and fat, but he's in America. He makes, um, face off. He makes, uh, Mission Impossible 2. So he's this very prolific action director. But in 1990, he makes this this action coming of age war, anti war movie called Bullet in the Head, which is set in the 60s about these three guys from Hong Kong who go down to Vietnam during the war and try to smuggle in drugs, get in, get out, make a, make a huge profit, get back to Hong Kong. Everything's going to be fine, which everything does not go fine. There's this terrible war going on. They get stuck there and it's just one bad thing after another. And it gets um, deeper and deeper into the atrocities of this war and how their, their greed and their survival kind of um, tears them apart as, as these lifelong friends. Um, it's very akin to the deer hunter. If anyone has ever seen that film, uh, the anti-war or anti-Vietnam picture from the seventies here in America with Christopher Walken and Robert De Niro. Um, and it, you know, it focuses on the, on the uh, torture of POWs and just the atrocities in the war. And um, it's a great movie. It's got a lot of great action, you know, both in the war, the war uh, settings and in the non-war settings. Um, but yeah, this is a, this is a film I think that's completely off the radar of most individuals watching uh, action films or war films. And it definitely needs uh, a little bit more, a little more attention. I like this movie. It's been a very long time since I've seen it, but I always like the idea that this came out in 1990 and it's about Hong Kong drug dealers going to Vietnam to sell drugs during the Vietnam War. So this, this film was filmed in the late 80s. The US left Vietnam in the mid 70s, but that doesn't mean, or that doesn't mean that things just automatically became peaceful in Vietnam. Like a whole lot of shit and fighting was still going on in Vietnam all the way into the late 70s. So this film being filmed in the late 80s, this was still very much fresh in the minds of people who lived in around that area. And I think this is an amazing perspective on not just the combatants, but on people living and lives and just, I don't know. There's a lot of, for me, when I look at this film, I think of diversity of perspective on a situation that Hollywood paints in a very different way about the Vietnam conflict and also how it connects to the other areas at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. I really like this pick. I do think it is underrated for sure. And it made me want to ask you, if you were to think, you know, 
this movie, Bullet in the Head, and you had five top choices of a John Woo film, would Bullet in the Head make it to your top five? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I was just curious about that because I, I know you like a lot of John Woo. So I, I do see, like John like, Woo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if, if y'all don't know this about me on this on this podcast, I'm a massive Hong Kong cinema fan, and of course, John Woo was one of the greatest filmmakers to come out of there. Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. Yeah. All right, brother. What you got for number four? Yeah, we can uh, go to a little more modern uh, choice here. Is this Inherent Vice from 2014, directed by Paul Thomas Anderson? Uh, there will be blood, boogie nights. The master. This is one of the most. This is you know one of those famous directors working today in uh, in art cinema. But uh, this one, it's it was kind of brushed aside as a second tier PTA. Um, and so, but this one to me, I, I really like. It. It's it's a uh, detective story set in the early seventies in LA. It's about the stoner private eye investigator, um, private investigator, excuse me, uh, of this you know, played by Joaquin Phoenix, who's just bopping around LA trying to solve a few different assignments. He slowly begins to learn that they are all tied together. Uh, but setting the backdrop of like Watergate is boiling up. We have the, the, the extreme right wing starting to come up, who's laying the groundwork for Reagan to become president. Um, and just a lot of different, you know, all this paranoia is kind of like just swirling around in this drug haze of, a, of an existence. And um, it's a really fun film. It's got some really great uh, performances in it. It's got a huge cast of, of people in it. And um, even though it's not as highly regarded with its, um, you know, deep mining of American characters, like some of Paul Thomas Anderson's more recent films, or it's not as experimental as some of those films, this one is just as good. And if you haven't seen it, I can't recommend it enough. Yeah, let me start by saying I always get Paul Thomas Anderson mixed up with Wes Anderson. And I adore Wes Anderson films. And I think yeah. they are all underrated. So shout out to Wes Anderson, all the weirdness that is his filmography. But but Paul Thomas Anderson is most certainly well known to me. And I think you're right. He is one of the most prominent art house directors. And, and a lot of times his films have Oscar buzz, like Licorice Pizza was probably his one of his more recent ones had Oscar mm -hmm. buzz with it. So I think you're right. This is a well-known director, but this film slipped under my radar. And but while I was watching it and thinking it was a Wes Anderson film, um, I, I kind of got like the weirdness a little bit like Wes Anderson. And I saw Owen Wilson was in it. And that also made me think of Wes Anderson. Um, so like I kind of feel like this had a different kind of vibe than your normal Paul Thomas Anderson film. I mean, would you say that's necessarily true? Like this is kind of his own section of his filmography and maybe that's why it's underrated? Yeah, yes and no. I think it's really underrated because it's it's kind of sandwiched between, or it came after he made some really big movies that kind of changed the art, the American art film landscape. So there will, there will be Blood and the Master had come out, these two highly regarded films. And then he makes a stoner comedy basically um, and I think people were disappointed that he wasn't making, he wasn't dropping this, you know, this new giant art film on people. I mean, he did that right after this with Phantom Thread, but like, I think um, fans were disappointed that there wasn't, uh, you know, something new like that. Um, but this kind of goes, you know, right in with his early features like Hard Eight and Boogie Nights. It's, it's, uh, you could definitely tell it's his style. Um, it's got a lot of the energy of his films, a lot of the playfulness of his of, of his films. And so, um, yeah, I think this was kind of like unfairly marginalized. But yeah, I, I'm interested to, to check this out. And while I'm not the biggest Joaquin Phoenix fan, I don't dislike him uh, or normally, like mm. really, I don't like or dislike actors or actresses uh, it's about if they're typecasted and if sure. they always play the same kind of roles mm -hmm. and i feel sometimes joaquin phoenix feels a little bit like that just like leonardo dicaprio i kind of feel like sometimes he he plays roles that are similar so mm -hmm. i don't always watch him but this one i kind of felt like the mixture between joaquin phoenix and paul thomas anderson i thought this could be an interesting combo to watch so i'll probably check this one out too yeah. all right let's jump into your number three Oh yeah, my number three is probably the most uh, peculiar movie on this list. That uh, is an understatement, my <laughs> friend. <laughs> so it's called Night Riders with a K. Night Riders uh, from 1981, directed by George A. Romero. Um, the tra so we'll get into talk about the trailer in a little bit, but the trailer is very misleading as to what really this film is about. So this is uh, a film from George Romero, who is the famed director of Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Creepshow. He's very famous for his horror movies. 
This is a film he made about a traveling Renaissance uh, festival company that uses dirt bikes instead of horses. And it's <laughs> and, they do, and it's kind of, it's, it sounds like a goofy premise, uh, but it's really about a, a, a movie about found family and about uh, the lives of performers. And uh, it's a it's a counterculture film, uh, American counterculture film. So it's this they're this traveling family and they go from town to town and they have to deal with the uh, local authorities who are trying to shake them down or they they encounter other you know other people who frown upon the way they live because uh, there's a diverse uh, cast of people that live with them, um, you know, gender, race, sexuality, all these things, um, these people have all accepted in this family of these performers. Uh, but it's told under the, under the, um, the sort of an interpretation of the King Arthur story where the leader of this group is like Arthur and he's trying to, he's trying to do the right and noble thing to lead his group. And uh, there's the Black Knight who is his foil, who is the guy who is trying to uh, who, or who thinks he should be in charge? Who's who's the top performer in their group? And um, yeah, this is a great, great movie. Um, I think the trailer doesn't quite sell or represent what this movie is really about. It kind of only um, shows you the 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 Renfest stuff in the trailer. It kind of only shows you uh, the action parts of it, which are when they're performing. It doesn't really go deep into them fighting with the police or dealing with domestic abuse or dealing with the struggles of their sexuality on the road and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, this is a great movie about um, counterculture in America in the probably I would say this is probably representative of the 70s but it came out in 81 um so yeah this is uh, to me it's just like I feel like it's just just as good as like easier writer or something like that that's um exploring that aspect of American life my friend you are absolutely right the trailer does not <laughs> depict anything that you just said um <laughs> let me let me paint this picture for listeners all right mm -hmm. I'm a I'm queuing up the trailer list uh, to watch what's going on. And I get to this one and I'm like Knight Rider. I'm like, for those of you who don't know, Knight Rider is also the name of like this cheesy 1980s TV show with like a, a talking car or something like yeah, that. Yeah, in the Hoff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm getting a little weird vibe anyway. But then I queue up the trailer and there is a, a, a man putting on knight's armor and a maiden <laughs> who is helping him put on his armor and he, he gets his joust in position and then suddenly you hear run 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 and he's on a motorcycle <laughs> and it just goes from there <laughs> and they're jousting on motorcycles and they're riding around and i'm like what is this like monty python you know <laughs> search for the holy grail or something so no my friend it, it, you're your description actually to me sounds like a really good movie um because this at first just seemed kind of like a parody film you know <laughs> yes. some which i'm not saying it would have been bad i probably would watch a film about people who joust on motorbikes anyway <laughs> but to hear that it's actually a film about counterculture and carnival life and about the the people who actually live there and who take part in this lifestyle and who embrace an openness and an accepting about who each other is and about the differences and diversity who makes us as individuals. You know, that sounds like a gripping tale that just also happens to have jousting and motorcycles. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, you know, let me ask you, because I, I just remembered um, a listener had asked a while back if we could say, like, where could someone check out some of these films? So if someone did want to check out Knight Riders, where do you think would be their best bet to look to watch it? Well, that's a good question. I'm not 100 percent sure where it is, but I think it may be on Tubi, uh, T-U-B-I. It's that free streaming service. It's got commercials. Uh, so you can sign up for it and watch a lot of good content on there. We have to sit through the commercials, um, but I believe it's on Tubi, or at least it was uh, in recent memory. Or if you're lucky, you could get it from your local library. Public yeah, libraries, yeah. people support the reading. Yeah, yeah, that too. I like this pick though, man. I do. George A. Romero is definitely well known to me, but I had never heard about this one. So <laughs> good choice, good choice. Yeah, yeah, and I would say that just a quick note that this film, also, it can easily be translated to any other kind of performing uh, art. So whether you're th a theater or a wrestler or um, musicians, I think that this film has a, is, is very universal in kind of exploring um, what it means to be a performer. I dig it, I dig it. All right, what you got for number two? Yeah, number two, uh, talking about uh, a film that I really, really, really love. It's called Bringing Out the Dead. 
by Martin Scorsese. Uh, this is a film that came out in 1999. Uh, this is the last picture of the 20th century. It stars Nicolas Cage as a worn down EMS uh, driver in the early 90s. So just to paint a picture, the early 90s, this was before Rudy Giuliani was mayor of New York and really cleaned it up. Uh, so this is still when New York was very dangerous and had a lot of crime and um, the, econ the economy was not great. And so this is a, a tale of an EMS driver who basically has to go, who works the night shift and he just really worn down by what he witnesses and what he has to do every night. And um, it sounds like it could be a very transgressive story, but what it really is, it's about uh, empathy and this man who who starts to perceive his job as an EMS driver is not to save lives, but to be a witness to people's deaths. And uh, he begins to have these- Damn. Yes, he begins to have these, this the outlook of it that he is there to witness, hopefully, uh, you know, the dignity of death and not some, you know, he's haunted by people he's lost. And so he worries about, you know, how people are maybe embarrassed by where they die or, um, you know, the fact that they've died in certain ways, they, they've lost their dignity. And so he is there to watch them um, pass away. And this is this is based on a novel, but who uh, I think Joe Connolly is the author who actually was an EMS driver. So I'm not sure how faithful it is to the novel he wrote, but it's based on his personal experiences. But um, to me, this is, you know, this is the really good, um, the really great part of who Scorsese is as a filmmaker, his empathy and his mining of spirituality in his films and, and when he goes down those paths he doesn't quite get the same attention as when he makes ultra violent masculine films and so um this film i think is superb in all its execution to show you just how crazy the city is and to show you how tired and lonely these drivers are and it's just a great 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 movie by you know by one of america's greatest filmmakers yeah you know i, I think a lot of people especially now we're coming into the the 2020s, you know, or 2022 in the middle of it. A lot of people don't remember. And granted, we were both young as hell during this time period. Maybe we weren't <laughs> yeah. even born. People, who knows? But in the 1980s, in the 1980s, when crack hits the United States, it was a different time period. Like in the 1980s, even into the early 1990s, New York was a very different place. And the crack epidemic that gripped New York City and the crime that came in that time period um, in a lot of different ways. I mean, we've talked about it in the scope of like talking about mafia films and talking about John Gotti before, mm -hmm. but, you know, and thinking about it in other terms of like New Jack City is a good one to bring into like the, the crack cocaine epidemic, heroin epidemic. And to kind of take that same time period and flip it to the perspective of an ambulance driver that's a really unique take on the situation because at this point in time in New York, overdoses are widespread. Shootings are widespread. Ambulance drivers are working all the time and they are witnessing so, so much. And if you're an individual who is in the middle of that, how do you internalize it? And just from the trailer, because I haven't seen this one, although I'm very intrigued about it as well, I kind of wonder how would you do it? And it looks as like the trailer gets on and it looks like it's progressing further and further into the movie. It looks like the driver themselves, you know, Nicolas Cage is turning more and more pale, the more and more dark circles are under the eyes. And it looks like there's a progression, like Nicolas Cage is dying or, or maybe he is dead and he's amongst the dead so much that it's had a profound impact on his life. And I think whenever you say that, you know, he's taken the mentality that he's not there to save lives, but he's there to witness people passing. I mean, damn, dude, that's a profound perspective to take on this time period, for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it gets deep into like his, the, or I guess he a little bit explains that you have to compartmentalize these things, but I think he he's beyond that. He's not a character who can do that anymore. And he's to the point where it is bothering him and he doesn't know what to do. And, but the city needs city needs people like this right they need people who are going to be able to go out there and help people because you don't you know not everyone dies they're able to save some people but um yeah you know this it's got a, it's got a little bit of like the orphe or the orpheus uh myth in it about you know in the underworld of like new york is this underworld full of ghosts and he is this this person who is passing through it and so uh yeah it's it's a profound movie about empathy and and um 
and of course it does have uh, a great Nicolas Cage freak out in the middle of the movie so if you are one of those Nicolas Cage heads out there who loves watching a great performance of a man having a freak out you should definitely put this one on your list <laughs> <laughs> yeah every time I see something with Nicolas Cage nowadays I, I still always think back to his movie con air and he has that southern accent and he's like <laughs> i told you to put down the money <laughs> and it's like ah oh, but he still works he yeah. still works yeah. anyway anyway i love the to, guy yeah to your number one the top underrated film by a famous director who you got yeah this is a tough one so i had to go with it uh it's red beard from 1965 by akira kurosawa uh, argue, I mean, to me, he was the greatest that ever that ever lived, um, greatest director ever lived. He's made tons of influential films, uh, uh, Seven Samurai, uh, Yojimbo, Hidden Fortress, uh, many, many more. But this one is like my like the number two pick. This is another story of empathy in the medical field. It's about a young uh, medical student who comes from wealthy family, and so he's kind of been given everything that he's uh, in his life goes to do his, um, I guess, residency, you'd call it, at this remote medical facility. And Redbeard, played by uh, Toshiro Mifune, is the head doctor there. And he's a really gruff local guy who is hard to get to know. And he's very stern in his teachings and stuff. And so um, it's really a story of, of them coming to understand each other and, and this, this young guy you know, coming of age and understanding the empathy that this man is trying to teach him and how, you know, how it is to treat uh, the patients here. And so it has a lot to do with them treating um, people of different uh, illnesses, maybe mental or they're on having, you know, mental illness or they're dealing with um, addiction. And so, I mean, it is, it is also set in feudal Japan. So there's a lot of hardships that they have to go through and things they have to witness in this, um, in this setting. Um, so it's very low on action, whereas Akira Kurosawa was kind of known for being able to blend very artful cinema with action in his films but this one is a, is, is a straight drama um and it's a very long film and it's known as like the real last great movie that he made for a long time uh this was the film that he and mafune after making about 15 films together had a falling out and he tried to commit suicide after this film came out and his career just kind of fell apart um, after being the most prolific filmmaker in his country um and so, yeah, you could see this labor of love, how painstakingly this film was made. And you could see just because of this film, so much of the personal stuff behind it kind of fell apart. Um, but yeah, I think it, get, it gets kind of brushed aside because it doesn't have the sensationalism of his other films. It's not as influential as other films, but it is one, you know, without a doubt, a solid, amazing picture. Yeah, I'm not surprised at all you chose Kurosawa as your, your number one because he's an amazing director and this this film I'm only vaguely aware of like it normally does have good buzz when I do hear about it but like you said um Seven Samurai and Hidden Fortress are the big names when you hear about Kurosawa and Red Beer is is not well known but whenever you talk about you know thinking about dealing with medical conditions and the very I don't know, finite intricacies. I just put those words together. We should edit this out and turn <laughs> it into something else. Oh, we're going to leave it in. It's summertime. Anyway, so like, but just dealing about, thinking about dealing with different medical conditions, but putting that in the context of feudal Japan. That's very interesting to me because whenever you turn back the clock on medicine and how we as human beings have addressed helping other people, it is an extremely different story. And our understanding how patients suffer for, through different things. It was also very different hundreds of years ago. You know, it was even different a hundred years ago, without a doubt. So I do like the idea of taking that as a backdrop and then putting it in feudal Japan. But I also like the background you said about like, this is one of Kurosawa's or was Kurosawa's last great masterpieces. And yet it is completely, you know, flown over or underrated for his bigger pieces. I dig it, my friend, I dig it. And that is Gregory Day's top 10 most underrated films by famous directors. And of course, as always, I got a few questions for you. And firstly, yeah. why this list? What made you choose this topic? 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, kind of doing researching, kind of doing research on different topics for these lists, I kind of, um, I read a lot of stuff uh, and follow a lot of individuals in film circles um, who talk about films and, or if, you know, I meet people who are in their um, early stages of getting into film and there's a lot of resources out there and a lot of them will focus only on very specific films by directors, these films that are huge uh, cultural milestones or these, you know, there's a lot of films that, that film culture attaches to and so um, I just kind of wanted to make a list that would be like, yeah, you love these films by these filmmakers. And these are the, and when I did this list, I went to try to find the most prolific filmmakers uh, to spotlight, uh, even though some of them may be like John Woo and George Romero. I had to kind of like sneak my little favorites in there. Um, <laughs> but there are so many other great films, um, you know, uh, that we could be talking about that are by these filmmakers that you, you know, that should also be given a chance, um, you know, the chance in the spotlight. I dig it. I dig it a lot. Um, did you have any runners up? Because 10 is just so, so, I mean, there's a million and one movies. You have to choose 10. So any any love you want to shout out there? Yeah. So the two I had to cut from the list is uh, Ingmar Bergman's Shame. It's a mid-60s anti-war film. Um, it's about this couple who is torn apart by an invading force. And it's it's very much a, a, um, a movie about the Vietnam conflict. Um, and then another film that I really love uh, that I couldn't fit in here is called Il Baidone, which is a film by Federico Fellini, which kind of gets overshadowed because it's between two of his really great films of the 50s. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a film about this aging con artist who is uh, going to pull a heist, but he runs into his adult daughter who they're estranged, and he decides that he would like to turn his life around after she comes back into his life. And uh, of course, in a Fellini film, the world is very cruel, and he has a hard time kind of getting to where he wants to get to. And so I think it's an excellent film. It's an excellent uh, character piece. And so um, those are two great masterpieces, honestly, um, of world cinema that just kind of get overshadowed because their directors are so famous and they've made these massively famous movies, uh, but they're still really great. You just you just made me think about something. Um, you said world cinema and it made me think like, who, who even watches world cinema today? And it made me think world cinema is still coming out today. Top 10 most recent overlooked global cinema movies. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just thinking like, I may put a list together that you have to listen to, my friend. Who knows? <laughs> um, yeah. But I dig it. I dig it. I always like bringing in movies from other countries, uh, for sure. All right, but now our next question for you. So your list is titled Top 10 Most Underrated Films by Famous Directors. And my question is, if your list was titled top 10 most underrated films how different of a list would that be than the one you did today i think it'd be completely different uh because i think not restricting myself to just talking about films by famous directors uh would change it completely um you know looking at uh other films by maybe a filmmaker made one movie or a genre movie that's you know really strong but it's this b movie or it's films from uh underserved authors like authors i say authors i'm a bookseller jesus <laughs> underserved directors um you know from different cultures from from different regions of the world so uh it would be completely different i don't think any one of these movies maybe you know maybe one of one of them would have made it on the list uh maybe bringing out the dead or something um but i think um yeah it would be com completely different um and yeah i mean i think um we could do a whole under you know or I guess one one thing I was struggling with for this one was to talk about uh, women directors because um, if you if, if I'm looking at resources that say who are the most famous directors, it is dis disproportionately male. So um, I think it would be safe to say that pretty soon I would like to do something that is just talking about uh, women directors and show you that uh, or illustrate through a list that even you know there are these ten great films by male filmmakers, but there are just as you know there is a list somewhere that's just 10 pictures that are just as good as those films that tackle the same subjects or have the same vibes that are all done by women i dig that i dig that and you're you're right um i think it, it is obvious when you look at you know the fact that even if you just think about the oscars there's a reason why that there is a male and female category at the oscars for just about everything and it's because if you go far enough back in the day i, I mean Hollywood's been dominated by men since its inception. So 
in order at the Oscars for them to not be considered gender biased and not to just have like best picture of the year or best actor of the year or best supporting actor of the year and then have it all be men, they got smart and they were like, well, why don't we just separate them into having best actor and best actress? That way it seems like equal categories, just splitting it based on gender. But more and more, they're starting to come under scrutiny about separating it based on gender. And yeah. the the pushback from the Oscars and Hollywood in, gen, in general is if they combine the categories, they're afraid that the Academy voters are going to point blank always vote in men or the list will be predominantly men and the people who win the Oscars will be predominantly men. And sure. it's a similar argument as far as African-American representation at the Oscars, other minority uh, representation, Latino representation. Um, so I think, yeah, a list about female directors would be great. Um, I yeah. think I would be interested to learn because I don't know a whole lot because like you said, it's it's disproportionately a male-dominated industry in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. I'd also say like, this is my personal opinion, but I think you should take the take the Oscars with a grain of salt because it is an industry award um, where you do have to spend lots of money to even get nominated, much less win. You have to run a marketing campaign. And so it's not really an ob objective body that's looking at uh, everything that everyone's done and, and, and everyone's on a, um, you know, equal playing field to get a nomination or a win. Um, it's really the people who have enough money to get themselves in there or the studios paid enough money or the producers paid enough money to try to get those awards and so um but it is you know having said all that it does have you know the the voters the people who vote in the academy awards they are going to vote in a, in a specific way and that's very telling of the industry oh most certainly so most certainly so and and we are starting to see more and more change and more and more pushback um so mm -hmm. i've kind of just been over the years since I've been made aware of it, keeping an eye on it and see like how it's changing over time. And I'm curious, like for instance, the, um, how, what was it? The most recent edition of uh, most popular a movie chosen by the fans where Twitter voters, uh, Twitter users got to vote for that Oscar or award. Mm -hmm. Did you hear about this? I don't think so. Yeah, so they technically they didn't get an Oscar, but you could like hashtag um, your favorite popular movie and you at the Oscars or the Academy. Mm -hmm. And it, it was like for a week or two weeks uh, this spring before the Oscars took place, maybe in like February. And after they tabulated the votes and whoever the voters chose on Twitter, that's who they announced at the Oscars. And I want to say it was a zombie movie um, <laughs> that won. Yeah. And, and, and like I said, like they didn't get an actual Oscar, they didn't get mm -hmm. an Academy Award, but they did get like recognition that it was, you know, a zombie movie isn't likely ever going to win a best picture motion uh, award mm -hmm. but still to give them a little bit more love mm -hmm. um, yeah so the oscars is they're a little bit aware of you know how mm -hmm. they've been typecasted and i think yeah. that's true of the entire yeah. industry yeah yeah well i will I just want to say because at hipsville we love genre movies but there are <laughs> there are some zombie movies that are better than some of these movies that have won best picture out there just gonna put, just gonna say that Oh, I dig it. I dig it. I definitely <laughs> want to hear more about that. Top 10 zombie movies, maybe. We'll see. We'll see. Top 10 zombie movies directed by women. Ooh, that's, mm. a, that's a tough one. Ah, uh, yeah. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. All right. Now to our last question, really a two-part question for you, one mm -hmm. we always like to end on. Why is this list specifically important to you? And why should other people view this list as important as well? Yeah. So I think why this is important to me is like we have these this culture of film and everything. We have these uh, highly regarded people that we as a culture have chosen to say are highly regarded, but we all kind of won't really dig deeper beneath a handful of each of these directors films. I mean, Hitchcock has probably 20 to 30 highly influential films yet. We only kind of talk about, you know, five or six. Um, and so what I was hoping to aim with this list was discuss a broadening of perspectives uh, of, of someone's body of work. And so uh, we're just not focusing on some of these features. Uh, this is why I think that, um, you know, why I think other people should get into, or why this list is important for other people. It's like, if you think about it, like Martin Scorsese has made over 30 features in his career, yet Damn. He, is, he is mostly defined by the five or six crime movies he's made. Um, and that's disproportionate to who he is as an artist. I mean, he's, I think he's much more, um 
interesting when he's dealing with things of issues of faith or uh, empathy from his background of growing up as a, as a Catholic, um, these things he's struggling, like he's mining the struggle of what it means to be an empathetic spiritual person. Yet when he makes a, a macho crime film, that's what our culture is much more interested in um, these, you know, tales of violence. And so um that's the point of this list is to say like oh we have these these great filmmakers like Romero who's making zombie films but he's also really great at at you know telling stories about um about people which is what his zombie films are really about but like this is this doesn't have any of the violence or the carnage and so um yeah so I'm hoping this list will help folks who who will want to get deeper beneath the surface of, of filmmakers careers uh not just these filmmakers but any any filmmaker watching like try to try to dig deeper into their um their 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 bodies of work and see like where they succeeded and maybe look at their failures and say like oh i can see what you're trying to do there but it just didn't quite work or or you completely succeeded but you know people didn't turn out to watch it so um and now they get buried in the uh the passage of time so uh yeah i'm hoping this will this will uh, push folks to kind of dig deeper when they're searching out flicks i like that i like that and i also hear you know a lot of people talk about you know, even though we have as much content coming out as we do these days, it doesn't mean it's all good. And in fact, a lot of the sure. content coming out is crap. Yes. Um, but yet yes. we have a wealth of a, a backlog of cinema um, that we know nothing about. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's incredibly important to say, hey, look, you don't need to look for the newest thing. Have you checked out this lately? Yeah. Um, I dig that. And I do want to ask you one last question that made me think about it, too. So you um, getting back to where people can find some of these films, you said like Tubi is one place. Where might be some other places that people can check out movies um, for free or for not free, but just where you think of like when you look, think about looking at old cinema or genre cinema mm -hmm. from the 70s, 60s and 50s, where are some places people can find films from those eras? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the greatest things that you can get today, uh, unfortunately, it's not free, but um, the Criterion Channel is one of them. Um, the Arrow Player is another uh, site. It's by Arrow Video. Um, they have a great uh, curated um, content. Um, yeah, Tubi is really the only really like free one you can get, uh, but they do have really good stuff on there. But it's almost like watching old television, like in the '90s when you'd watch a movie on TV. Um, but they're not they're not cut like they would be. So, but you just have to sit through the commercial breaks. Um, let's see, uh, Shutter for uh, horror fans is a really great uh streaming service um but if you happen to live in a town that still has a video store go support your local video store they're gonna have things that oh yeah uh they're gonna have things that you're never gonna be able to find on streaming um and so you know they might have an old dvd or an old vhs player if you have a player an old vhs copy is a movie that you cannot find anywhere um but i highly recommend uh anyone um out there who's keeping track of what you're watching or uh want to find where something is playing uh to, to use letterboxd.com it's uh it's almost it's a social media plus review site for movies and there is a feature that is linked up to uh another service called where to watch and you can look up a movie and it'll tell you where it's streaming or where it's rentable online so whether it's itunes or oh, amazon nice. yeah and so it'll tell you if it's available on those services um and what is it again uh, it's called Where to Watch, which you may be able to use um, independently, but if you're losing Letterboxd, uh, which is uh, L-E-T-T-E-R-B-O-X-D dot com, um, each, each, uh, paid, each movie page is linked up to Where to Watch. It'll tell you where that movie is. Oh, that's good stuff, man. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks. I, like I said, you know, some listeners have asked in the past, so I appreciate yeah. it. Superb stuff right there for you, little five listeners. But Gregory, Day, before you take off for today, why don't you tell the good people where to find you and maybe what you've been working on lately? Yeah, you could find uh, what I do for Hipsville AD over at badday.substack.com. It's where I publish my uh, essays on cinema. And the penultimate essay in my Real Revenge series is up right now. Hoping to get that sewn up here by the end of the month. Um, you can also find me on Instagram at Hipsville AD. And if you ever want to send me a question or you want to talk movies or anything, uh, you can email me at hipsvillead at gmail.com. And, and so the penultimate, that's that's what you're working on. But forgive me, it's summertime. What does penultimate mean? I, I, my brain is turned <laughs> off. <laughs> it is the second to last. So uh, okay. the finale is coming up. This is the second to last one in the series. 
Excellent stuff, man. I look forward for the last. All right. And that's Hipsville AD's top 10 list. Check out our friend Gregory Day online. Follow him everywhere, people. And it's not a cliche or a catchphrase. It's a lifestyle. Always remember that lo-fi poly science is more than just me. It's the we that we view. Talk to you tomorrow, lo-fi listeners. Pickering and Day, ending off. So.